Hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan Strauss. I'm the manager of the Future Students Office here at the University of New South Wales. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. Uh, before we begin this evening, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation, and any elders, past or present, who may be joining us this evening. So thank you for coming here to the University, our Kensington campus, for our Year 10 Subject Selection and Information Evening. We have a whole bunch of information to get through this evening um, about subject selection, obviously, and what you should be looking at for the HSC, and potentially um, what you should be considering as a Year 10 student as you go into the HSC and are thinking about coming to university in the future. So things like scholarships, bonus points, how to apply, all the rest. Here is a quick snapshot of our program this evening, so we'll keep this to an hour, and that, after which we will have some sandwiches out in the foyer for you, and then the faculties will be available again to, to answer any of your additional questions. So we'll quickly cover subject selection, not quickly, that's the bulk of the information this evening. Um, we'll then also go into UAC, so Trudy from UAC is here to walk you through what you need to know about ATAR and the application process to university, even though that's a bit in the future. Um, scholarships and co-op to, to tell you why as a year 10 student it, it pays to start thinking about scholarships now. And then finally, um, one of our current students, Heidi, will relay a little bit about her experience with subject selection and picking the right degree and the subjects for her. So that's how the program is going to work. I promise I am not shy, so please feel free to take photos of the screen. I will try to make sure that I look beautiful and wonderful in the middle of that present and that photo as well. You can try to get me out of the photo um, if you're so inclined, but I'll do my best to make sure that I'm in it. So, <clears throat> a couple of quick things on subject selection. Um, this presentation is actually brought to you by NESA, the New South Wales Education Standards Authority, which used to be known as the Board of Studies, or actually BOSTIS before the Board of Studies. Um, so confusing name changes over the last couple of years, but this presentation is what they provide to schools across New South Wales. New South Wales is actually one of the largest standardized education systems, secondary education systems in the world. And so as a result of that, it is often quite confusing in terms of all of the different options that may be available to you in the HSC. So we're going to unpack those in terms of the subjects available to you and what you need to be conscious of in terms of the way it all comes together. So you can find this presentation on the NESA website if you're so inclined, but again, feel free to take photos of slides this evening as well for any of the information that you think is particularly pressing and important for you. So important things about the HSC, what is it? It is the culmination of your entire year 11 and year 12 study history at, at high school. Um, it is what is going to, to record what you've done and what you've accomplished in that time. It is the highest educational um, qualification that you can achieve in a secondary school in New South Wales, and it reports on your achievement over a standard that is set for all students in New South Wales. So that's an important thing to remember. You're being compared to all students in New South Wales. And um, the next slide covers the detail of what the actual HSC structure is. So importantly, the HSC, each individual subject in the HSC has a unit value. Most of those courses are two units in value, and that equates to about 120 hours of instruction. And they have a, a total score possible of 100. There are also one unit courses that are exactly half of the two unit courses. So they have 60 hours of instruction, and they can get a maximum mark of 50. Many of those one unit courses are extension subjects, so it's important to think about how they play into your actual study pattern, and we'll talk about those individual subjects as we um, go through the presentation this evening. So the preliminary year, also known as your year 11 year, you are going to need to do a minimum of 12 units of study, and you must obviously satisfactorily complete your year 11 study in order to progress on to year 12. This is stuff that's not terribly difficult, but it gets more complicated, I promise. Um, the HSC course, or year 12, the things that we refer to as year 12, is going to be a minimum of 10 units. You can study more than 10, if you're so inclined, um, and you may choose to do that. You, there are students who will sometimes choose to do 14 units, um, but it, the important thing is that it will be count, your HSC will be, your ATAR will actually ultimately be counted on your 10 best units. So Trudy will talk about that a little bit later this evening about how that all comes together. 
There's a couple of distinctions in the type of courses that you can choose. So we've already covered that there are different unit values within HSC subjects, but there are also different types of courses, and they have a, an impact on how you actually get a result. So the first type of course is the board-developed course. And what does this mean? It's an, it, it is a subject in the HSC that has an HSC exam component as part of it. Um, it may be included in the calculation of an ATAR, and it does include some of the VET um, vocational education um, and training courses that are available, and the life skills course that's offered by um, Board of Studies, NESA, as well. Then there are board-endorsed courses. The board-endorsed courses have no HSC exam, um, and they are not included in the calculation of an ATAR. So you need to be conscious of that when you're thinking about, I'm, I would assume most of you are thinking about coming to university in the future. If you weren't, you probably wouldn't be here this evening. So be conscious of the fact that when you select board-endorsed courses, you need to still make sure that you're getting enough courses to count to create an ATAR. And Trudy, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and again, some of the VET courses are also covered by board-endorsed courses. Then, to keep it extra exciting, we also add in Category A courses and Category B courses. So what is a Category A course? It may be included in the calculation of an ATAR, and it has a compulsory HSC exam. The Category B course can be no more than two units. You can't take more than two units of a Category B course, um, and it can be included in your ATAR calculation. Um, there is an optional HSC exam, and again, much, much of the VET curriculum framework falls under the, the Category B course. So there's slight distinctions between board-developed, board-endorsed, Category A, and Category B, and it will be important for you to make sure that you're counting these up appropriately when you're looking at, I'm university-bound, and what am I going to need to be able to get into university at the end of the day? Most of your schools will help you with this process. They will sit down and look at what you've actually enrolled in and, and selected, and they'll say, great, you're clearly well on the track of getting everything in order. Some of your schools will not do that, and so you will need to own that process yourself. So make sure that if you have questions about this process that you speak to a Board of Studies liaison officer from NESA. All of their information and contact details are on the NESA website, and you can find out if you have specific questions that need to be answered, they can assist you with that process. Also, feel free to talk to your teachers, talk to your careers advisor, your year advisor, just to make sure that you've got everything in order um, for what you're hoping to do in the future. So what are the requirements for the HSC? You need to do at least two units of compulsory English. I am very sorry to tell you that you must do English no matter how much you love it or hate it. Um, and that is a standard for all students in New South Wales. Some of you may have family or friends who are studying in other states in Australia who don't have compulsory English as part of their, their secondary study requirements, and that's true. And they don't have to take English, but you do. So you must take it no matter what your interest level in it is, you will do two units of English. Um, you must also do at least six units of board-developed courses, and those will be the ones that have a compulsory HSC exam. You must also do at least three courses of two unit value or higher, and at least a total of four subjects. You have to have a minimum of four subjects in the HSC year. And then finally, you can, for those of you who are super keen on science, you can't do more than six units of science. I'm really sorry. Usually there's a groan. Cue the groan. Oh, good job, excellent, thank you. Satisfactory completion of a course. This is fairly self-explanatory. This is not difficult, but it essentially says that you need to follow the course outline as, as has been developed and approved by the Board of Studies, or NESA. Um, you as a student, while studying that particular course, need to apply yourself with, to the best of your ability and attempt all of the, the assignments and exams and assessments as outlined and make a genuine attempt to complete them. Um, and you need to try to achieve, it says some, but let's go for all of the course objectives and outcomes. And with, board, with VET developed courses, you do need to make sure that you complete the mandatory work placement. So do factor that in if you're selecting a VET course. Make sure that you select a VET course that has a work placement that you're comfortable with in, the terms, of, in terms of the timing that it will require from you to get that work placement completed. We then go into the additional completion requirements for some of the HSE courses, and this goes into um, the fact that HSE assessments contribute to an excess of 50% of the available marks in a course um, for the internal assessments, and you need to make a serious attempt, like I said before, at all of the assessment tasks within that particular subject. So HSE All My Own Work is something that the Board of Studies, NESA, 
and BOSTES introduced probably, I think, about four years ago, five years ago, and it requires that all students who are completing, starting year 11, um, complete the HSC All My Own Work curriculum. It's a, an online um, kind of uh, module. Uh, what it does is it essentially says, you're aware of what plagiarism is, you're aware of what your responsibilities are as a student studying the HSC, as well as what the expectations are of you as a student, and that you promise to do your best in all of those bits and pieces. You'll find out more, your school will lead you through this process, but do make sure that you're aware of that as well. So now some of the key bits and pieces that you need to know about the individual subjects that are offered as part of the HSC. So we'll start with English. In your preliminary year in English, again, year 11, you will have these four subjects to choose from within the English curriculum. They are English Advanced. You will have an option that's a two-unit course. You'll have an option to add an extension to that, English Extension 1, which you would complete alongside English uh, Advanced, and that would be a one-unit extension. So you would have a total of three units of English if you did that subject. You also will have English Standard, English EAL slash D, which is for students who are learning English as an additional language or dialect, which used to be known as English as a second language. Um, and then you have English Studies. So there are various reasons why you would choose any one of these subjects. Importantly, if you are a student who comes from an English as a second language background, either your family is at home speaking another language, you may not have learned English as a first language, then that is absolutely the right um, English language subject for you to do, and it will, not, it will not be a penalty for you to have done that. However, if you grew up here in Australia and have been speaking English for your entire life, you also will not be allowed to do the English as a second language subject. Um, anyone who goes into that particular subject will need to sign a statutory declaration indicating that they are appropriately placed into that subject. Why? Because that would be unfair if we put people into that subject who were native speakers and it wouldn't be, it would it advantage you unfairly. So your school will go through that process if that is something that's appropriate for you. Thinking about your ability and your interest is one of the things that you're going to want to consider when you're looking at the subject that's available. And we'll talk at the end of this little section about all of the things that you should consider with the individual subjects and why you select any one of them. When we move to year 12, in the actual HSC, your options are much the same with a couple of extra additions. English Advanced, again, has an extension one option and an extension two option. You must do them concurrently. So you have to do English Advanced with, ex uh, sorry, you can do English Advanced by itself, or, and then you can add on English Extension 1, and you can add on English Extension 2. You cannot do English Extension 1 by itself, or English Extension 2 by itself either. So those are all one big package for a maximum number of units of four units. Then you also have English Standard, what used to be known as English um, as a second language, and then English Studies as well. So that's the breakdown of what's available within English. Then we go into, quickly, this idea of extension courses. So English has extension one in English Advanced and English Extension two in year 12 year. That's part of the extension subjects, which are those one units of credit, which are measured uh, a total result of a potential 50 and 60 hours of study. Um, mathematics also has extension subjects, and we'll quickly look at what um, mathematics is, but there are also extension subjects in these areas of study as well. So in particular, some of the most popular ones are in history um, and in some of the sciences, as well as within music. So do keep these in mind if these are any areas that you're particularly interested in or imagine yourself studying in at university level in the future, because they could be beneficial to you for that reason. So with mathematics, this is not a compulsory subject in the New South Wales HSC. So unfortunately, usually it's parents who groan when I say mathematics is not compulsory, um, and students cheer. Um, but for those of you who really enjoy maths, there are really great options available to you in the HSC. In your preliminary year, in year 11, you have the two subjects, and this is new. This is a new, you, your cohort, this will be the first year that these are the two options, and this is the organizational structure of this. So if you've had an elder sibling who's gone through this process before, this will be different for you. Um, mathematics advanced as a two-unit subject with an optional mathematics extension one, but again, must be studied concurrently with mathematics advanced, or mathematics standard. Those will be your two options for mathematics in year 11. In year 12, you can do Mathematics Advanced with Extension 1 and potentially with Extension 2. And then Mathematics Standard, you will select between Standard 1 or Standard 2. 
So again, this is a different curriculum. This is new for just your cohort. It will probably change again for the year nine cohort um, because of the new uh, literacy and numeracy standards that are being rolled out across the country, which I'll mention momentarily. So those are the options. Again, look at what it is your particular um, degree of interest might be requiring or what your skill set might be requiring for a particular career. Um, and these are the reasons why you might choose one or the other. Also, your own individual skill and interest in that area. Languages are also offered as part of the HSC. And we as a university strongly encourage people to consider studying a second language, both because it's interesting, but also because it's going to be hugely valuable to you in a global society, in a global world in which um, multinationals and business trans, um, sends international boundaries and languages. So having an extra language is a valuable skill to have and could be very beneficial to you. There are four different levels of uh, foreign language taught in those particular subjects. So beginners and continuers is offered in all of the different languages. Remember though that your school may not offer language study in your particular chosen language. And so you may need to look at that at studying that at a nearby school or by distance through the, the distance um, school. Uh, those are all options. Keep them in mind if there's a, a language that you're particularly interested in studying that your school does not offer. But beginners and continuers is available generally everywhere. Um, then, uh, in all languages, sorry, not necessarily at every school. Then there is language in context and language in literature. And these are only offered in Chinese, Indonesian, Japanese, and Korean. With language in, con uh, sorry, language in context, I believe is the, um, uh, sorry, the beginners and continuers, and then there is a native speakers option as well. You need to make sure that you, again, are putting yourself and your school will help you with this process in terms of putting you into the right level of a particular subject. Again, if you are a native speaker of a foreign language other than English, um, you're not going to be able to say that you're a beginner um, and get an amazing result that helps to scale your ATAR better. That's not the way it works. Stat declarations will be in, required and are audited by NESA on a regular basis. The industry curriculum framework, I won't talk a great deal about this, but this is something that you may want to consider as part of your HSC and what might be considered. Um, the board developed HSC VET syllabus is all available to you and there's a huge range of courses there. Um, it does have an optional HSC exam and it um, has a mandatory work placement that you need to keep in mind in terms of the timing of your other subject load and when you'll get that completed. These are the board developed courses in VET. So you can choose from any of these subjects. Again, remember that you may not be able to complete this at your individual school because your school may not offer each and one of, every one of these on this list. So you may have to look elsewhere to do some of them, but remember that is an option available to you. So your HSC marks, just quickly, the internal assessment is 50% of your HSC mark. The external exam is 50%, and those add up to be your HSE reported mark. Trudy will cover this in more detail in a moment. Course selection. Why should you select any particular course, and how should you plan out what you actually study in? Obviously, your abilities. What are you good at? What do you enjoy studying? If you enjoy that particular area of study, you are likely to do better in it, and that is to your advantage. If you're not particularly good at it, but it's something that you think will be very valuable to you in the long run, think about how that plays into what level of that study you do in, in English or in mathematics, as an example. Um, or for any of the other extension subjects, if, if, say you were looking at history, if you enjoy history, but you're not really that great at it, then is extension one the option for, a good option for you or not? These are things that you should talk about with the people who know you, your teachers in particular, but also your peers, your parents, the university, the faculty, um, student ambassadors who are here this evening can answer questions about this kind of stuff as well. So do keep that in mind. Also look at your career aspirations and needs. What is it that your career is going to require? What If, if today I wanted to be a um, a lawyer, what is going to be required of me? Or a mechanical engineer, what is going to be required of me? Are there any assumed knowledge components, which I'll talk about later, or prerequisites um, for subjects in the HSC that you need to have completed in order to do well in that particular degree or career? Finally, the syllabus requirements. What are the major work components? What is the, the assessments? What are they like? When do they happen? When Are they all scheduled to happen at the exact same time? Um, in terms of practical work, um, if you have to submit major projects, are they due on the same week and therefore that's going to be difficult for you to manage or are you really on top of that kind of stuff and can manage all of those different competing deadlines with no dramas? 
have a think about what that looks like as well. Look through the syllabus. The syllabus is pu published online today. You can, look, you can download it and look at it and understand what it is that you're going to be learning all throughout that particular subject and that course and determine how well that works with what your skills are and what your interests are. And then look at what your other commitments are. The HSC, we as a university strongly encourage you not to drop everything in your life other than the HSC and focus on just the HSC. We think that's a bad idea. We are looking for people who are well-rounded, who, well who are interesting people, who've done things outside of the HSC and managed to keep some balance in their lives. So if that includes sport or music or a part-time job or volunteer opportunities, these are all things that help you to be a better person, a more interesting person, and that we're looking to have you come to the university, but we want those students who can keep a balance. So don't necessarily think about dropping everything just to focus on the HSC. What are your other commitments and what does that look like in terms of your future study? Again, very similar, but essentially on this slide, this is who you should be talking to. Your teachers, your careers advisor, um, your parents, I know that's painful to hear sometimes, but yes, your parents may have some thoughts on this. Um, and then other students in year 11 and year 12, currently, what is their experience, what has their experience been like? Have they enjoyed the subject that they studied? Was it the subject that was amazing or terrible? Or was it the teacher that was terrible or amazing? Um, and what does that mean in terms of your selection of that subject in the future? Have a think about all of those things. The other thing you should speak to is university representatives. We have some insights into what would be valuable and useful for you when you come to university. And I will talk about that a little bit later this evening with that prerequisite and assumed knowledge conversation. So 2020 changes to the HSC. Um, the fact that the HSC is changing in 2020 has caused a great deal of panic for a lot of people, but I can assure you that this does not affect you. So you do not need to worry about this particular thing, but just thought we would throw it up here so that you could see what is happening. The, the new numeracy and literacy standards will be impacting on the 2020 cohort, but they will not impact you as a year 10 cohort. This is after your time, so you get to sail through without having to worry about numeracy and literacy standards. But if you have a year nine sibling or you're the parent of a year nine student, they will affect you. And so it will be important to look at what happens um, in the future and what that looks like for years to come. For more information, you can definitely check out the, the NESA website um, and UAC. Um, there's tons of information on all of those, um, including this entire presentation with a whole bunch more slides that go into more detail that you probably didn't need this evening. Um, there was enough to take in with everything else. Um, and with that, I'll now hand over to Trudy Noller, who comes from the university's admission center, or UAC, who will provide a little bit more information about the calculation of an ATAR and what you need to be thinking about in terms of your ranks within individual subjects. Trudy. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Trudy Noller, as Jonathan said, is my name, and I'm the community engagement manager at UAC. Um, it's really nice to see so many people, to be honest. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about my very favourite subject, and that is the ATAR. Um, first of all, however, I'm going to talk about the difference between HSC and the ATAR, because once you wrap your head around that, then the ATAR will fall into place and you'll understand it a lot better. Now, when your student gets to Year 12 and they sit their exams, NISA will then send paperwork out that shows you the HSC results that that student has, um, has obtained by sitting their exams and, and all of their assessment tasks in Year 12. When you get that piece of paper, it will show every course and the HSC mark and the performance band that HSC mark is aligned to. So the performance band run from band one to six, with six being the highest. Now, when you get that piece of paper, those HSC marks are going to tell you about how well your student, your son, your daughter, has performed in the HSC. Performance. The next day, the ATAR is released, and that one number will tell you where your student is positioned amongst all other students in the state. Now, when we talk about the ATAR 
And HSC, we always liken this to a running race because we're talking position and performance. And as you know, they can look very different. So when we talk about the running race, we then talk about everyone in the state in this cross-country cross race because it's like the HSC. Everyone in the state is doing the same HSC exams. So we're in the running race. Fantastic. You run, run, run as hard as you can. You get to the end. You are so excited with yourself because you have just run your personal best. You are so thrilled. Mum and Dad are up there. Yay! Excited. You've performed very well. It'd be like in the HSC. We hope that you get to the end and you've done your exams and your marks come in and you've performed very well, better than you've ever done. You're at the finish line. You're standing there. You're excited. You've done your personal best. But when you're standing there and you look around, you might feel a bit disappointed because, you know what, I've just done my personal best, but I'm in the middle of the pack. So what does that mean? That place that you've, you've, you've come is like your ATAR. Because doing your personal best in the race, or like in the HSC, doesn't actually mean you're going to be placed first. Yeah? That's fairly easy to understand. Per position, performance. The only thing in the race, like in the HSC, that you can perform that you can control is how fast you're going to run. Like in the HSC, the only thing you can control is how well you're going to perform, how well you're going to study, what effort are you going to put in, yeah? You can't control the ATAR because you can't control your competition. So what is the ATAR? The ATAR, of course, is a numeric measure of a student's overall academic achievement in the HSC, um, that, of course, um, is all about position. It's a number from 0 to 99.95, OK? 0 to 99.95. And we at UAC will only report ATARs of 30 and above. OK, we don't tell you what it is below that, only 30 and above. And I think something that we do need to remember, um, especially as parents, and I know myself, I've had students or children that have gone through this, one thing we do need to remember is the ATAR is solely used for university entry and nothing else. And at the end of the day, if your student doesn't achieve that number that they were hoping for to get them into a particular course at a particular institution, then we have to remember that it, there are many other pathways to the courses that you may, your child may, may or may not want. Okay? Well, may want. If they don't want it, of course, they're not going to go there, are they? <laughs> um, so, yes, there's many other ways of, of gaining access. And it could be that they're just looking at a different course at the same university, or it could be that their ATAR is really not quite enough to get them to where they want to be, so they're going to take another pathway, uh, possibly into a prep course or something of that nature to get them to where they want to be. So remember, just for uni entry. Um, sometimes I talk to parents and they'll say, well, you know, uh, we're worried about this ATAR. And I always say, remember when they're in first class and you go up to listen to them read? and your child is doing uh, reader number three, and the child that comes next is doing, is doing reader number seven, you're thinking, hang on, what's, what's my child not doing? Remember, they all do things at a different level, at a different time. It's sort of like the ATAR. You know, they might get to the end. Maybe they haven't done their best right there and then, but it's not going to define them as a as a student for the rest of their life, like when they're in kindergarten or first class. They kept going and they kept progressing. So when your kid's child gets to year 12, yeah, maybe they haven't done as well as they hoped, but they're gonna progress and they're still going to move on and they're still gonna to get to where they wanna be, maybe just not right here, right now. 
that ATAR is just telling them where they're positioned right here, right now, at this point in time. Okay? Um, to be eligible for an ATAR, and Jonathan has touched on this, um, but to be eligible for an ATAR in Year 12, you need at least 10 units of bought, uh, sorry, bought in developed courses. Now, one of the things I do want to mention is the um, English Studies and Math Standard 1 at the moment are not ATAR eligible courses. Okay, so just be aware of that. If it changes, then your school will be notified and they'll be able to discuss that with you. But right at this moment, they are not ATAR courses. Um, your school will be able to help you with, um, with eligibility because usually, uh, and knowing, because I've been through this, knowing all about it, your school usually gets um, your student to write their courses down and you, uh, they bring it home and you would usually sign off to say, yes, we know they're eligible or no, yes, we know they're not eligible for an ATAR. Um, the ATAR is based on the best two units of English and the next best eight units after that. Now, when we say the next um, best eight units after that, that could also include the category B courses that Jonathan was speaking about, the VET courses. For those courses to be considered, you must sit the optional exam. If you don't sit the optional exam for those VET courses, then we can't use it as part of the calculation at all. But we can only use two units of Category B courses. Okay, two units. So, some students might take more than 10 units. Some might take 11 units. Some may take 12 or 13 units. Students that take the 11 units often will say, well, does that mean that my one unit of religion won't be included in the calculation? Um, well, it could be, yes. Because when we calculate the ATAR, we break all courses down into single units. So if one unit of religion is part of the best scaled marks, then that unit would be included and a unit from something else will not be. So it's the best scaled units. Scaling. This is something that we get asked about all the time. And I can tell you, um, it is not something we should be really worrying about at this stage. Why do we scale? When we calculate the ATAR, the first part of the calculation is actually scaling. And why do we scale? So we scale so that no student is neither advantaged nor disadvantaged because of their subject choice or their course choice. Okay? What scaling does is actually putting each person into order in their courses. Remember, ATAR is about position? Yeah? Right. We want to compare everybody fairly because how do we compare students who are doing physics, maths, four unit uh, of math to a student who's doing visual arts, history, language? How do we compare them? We do this thing called scaling. A lot of, before I go on to Fred and Laura, we want to talk about scaling a little more. When we see courses, People say, well, hang on, we should take that course, we should take physics, because it's got a high scaled mean. So that means I'm going to get a better ATAR. And I shouldn't take Aboriginal studies because it's got a really low scaled mean. But I'm here to tell you that we should not be looking at the scaled mean of a course, because the scaled mean of a course is just telling us about the ability of the students in the course. So courses with a high scaled mean tell us that the ability of the students in the course is quite high. So say for instance, chemistry. Other courses with have, that have a lower scaled mean just tell us that the ability of the students in the course is varied from high to low. It doesn't mean that you can't get a high ATAR, 
because remember it's about position. If you are doing very well in a course with the low scale mean, you're doing very well, you're positioning yourself well, which means you're going to be okay. If you're taking a course such as physics because it's got a high scale mean, but you're not doing well in it, which means your marks aren't so great and you're positioned low, then you're really not going to get any benefit of scaling at all. Okay, it's about position. It doesn't matter what you're studying, you've just got to do well. This is Fred and Laura. And I love Fred and Laura because this gives you a realistic uh, view of what happens with the ATAR. We can see here that Fred and Laura have done exactly the same courses. Fred has got marks of all 70, Laura marks of all 80. Now marks between 70 and 79 are what we classify as a typical band four student. Roughly 40% of students will get marks in this area. The average mark for most courses is around 75. It's not like in the dark ages when I went to school and you got 51 and you thought you were past, all right? 75 is roughly around the average. And if we have a look here, um, and we have a look at biology. Fred with a mark of 70 last year sounds really good, all right? Laura, mark of 80, only 10 marks different. However, what's actually telling us the story of the ATAR is not the, uh, the marks, because remember that's about performance, it's this percentile column. The percentile column tells us where they're placed within these courses. So bio biology, marker 70, put Fred in the 38th percentile. So he had 62% of students above him in that course. Laura, on the other hand, with just 10 marks more, was positioned in the 68th percentile. So a lot better position with just 10 more marks. If we look at advanced English, a mark of 70 last year put Fred in the 11th percentile, which sounds very low for a mark of 70, yeah? Look at Laura, mark of 80, still in the bottom 50%, because last year the HSE mean for advanced English was 81. So that's why she's still in the bottom 50% for advanced English. If we have a look at both their, both their marks and both their percentile columns, you can see that Fred is actually positioned in the bottom 50% for everything, where Laura, on the other hand, is in the top 50% except for advanced English. So, moral of the story is if you're a Fred, and there's nothing wrong with being Fred, but if you know you're afraid in year 10, my suggestion to you would be to work very hard, get your marks up, and make sure that you're at Laura's end of the band four and not Fred's. I'm gonna hand you back over to Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy. So now some quick things about getting you into the university and things that you should be thinking about now as a year 10 student. So if you were a year 12 student this year, your applications would close on the 29th of September. On-time applications for university close usually in September. That will probably be the same for you, so just be mindful of that. And remember that all of your applications for university in New South Wales and the ACT are going to go via the university's admission center or UAC, um, where you will get five preferences for five different degrees at different universities, and that is how you will be assessed at that application by all universities in New South Wales and the ACT. With these degrees here at UNSW, aviation, law, medicine, music, um, UNSW Canberra at ADFA, and the UNSW co-op degrees, there's something you're going to need to do in addition to an application to UAC. And this might be for aviation, a flight medical exam, and an application directly to the School of Aviation. Um, law has the law admission test, and that is a trial, so we don't know if that will be required for your cohort yet, but at the moment that is an additional selection criteria. Medicine has the UMAT required, a, an in application directly to the faculty, as well as an interview. Um, music has an audition and a theory test required. Canberra has the Defense Force recruiting process, and UNSW Co-op has a separate application and interview process as well. So if any of these degrees, you're, you're interested in those degrees, make sure that you're aware of what the additional selection criteria is, and and when you would be required to complete that generally in year 12. 
Also remember that if you are interested in any of our degrees in the Faculty of Engineering, the Faculty of Engineering admission scheme may apply to you. And at the moment, that would be if you have an ATAR of between 82 and 91.95, you may be eligible to be, get an offer into engineering, even if you're below that 92 cutoff, based on the subjects you did in the HSC, how well you performed in them, and how, well they're how much they're relevant to the degree at UNSW in Engineering. The same applies for BISAS, the B uh, Bachelor of Information Systems Admission Scheme as well. Um, portfolio entry is also available um, in the Faculty of Built Environment and in Art and Design. Um, these are for most of our degrees there, where you can submit a, a portfolio of your work completed in the HSC, and then be assessed for your admission into that degree based on that portfolio and your ATAR if you're up to 10 points below the cutoff published for that particular degree. Now, an important thing that I've me I mentioned earlier a few times, assumed knowledge versus prerequisites. So with assumed knowledge, we are assuming the University of New South Wales has assumed knowledge in place at the moment. We have no intention of, of reintroducing prerequisites, but some universities in New South Wales have recently, including um, the University of Sydney. Um, have introduced prerequisites for some subjects in the HSE, meaning if, you, if it is a prerequisite, you must have completed that HSE subject in order to get an offer into a particular degree at university. We do not have prerequisites. We did away with them about 10 years ago, and the reason was that not all students had equal access to the particular subjects that we had as prerequisites, and we also knew that there were other ways that students could potentially get that level of knowledge, and so we have made them assumed knowledge, meaning we assume that you will have done that subject in the HSC, but we will not prevent you from getting an offer into, the H into that degree if you haven't done it. But please note, you are going to be at a disadvantage in your first semester or first year of study if you have not done that subject that is assumed knowledge. Many of you will have upstairs at the uh, faculties up in the Tyree room picked up one of our undergraduate guides, the white cover guide. If you flip to the very back section of that guide, it lists all of our faculties and all of the degrees that we offer in that particular faculty. One of the columns there lists whether there are any assumed knowledge subjects for that particular degree. So do have a look at that and see if that applies to you. Um, bridging courses are available in chemistry, mathematics, and physics here at the university if you have not done an assumed knowledge requirement. Um, they are relatively inexpensive, about $380 for a four-week intensive course done in the February before you start your study at university. Um, but it is not a perfect substitute for having done an entire subject in the HSC. But again, better than nothing. So if you don't end up doing that subject, make sure that you look at bridging courses. We don't care what your actual result in a bridging course is, and we don't even care if you do that bridging course here at UNSW or at another university or TAFE or anywhere. It is purely for your benefit and to ensure that you are up to speed with where you need to be on day one of a particular subject. But be mindful of that as you're picking subjects for the HSC. What are the assumed knowledge requirements or prerequisites at other universities um, in the subjects that you actually do select? Bonus points, always a very popular discussion. Um, we offer three bonus point schemes here at UNSW, and we offer them in, in what we believe is quite, a, quite a transparent way, um, and I'll go through briefly what they are. So the HSC Plus bonus point scheme is for subjects you've done in the HSC and whether those subjects are relevant to the degree that you want to do here at UNSW. If that subject is, and you've done well in that subject, a band four, five, or six, or extension E3 or E4, you may be eligible for one to three bonus points per subject, up to the maximum number of HSC plus bonus points of five. What does that mean? So you get an ATAR from UAC, which is a 90. That's a great result. But you've also done well in particular subjects that are relevant to the preference, the degree preference you have here at UNSW, and you get three HSC plus points. Those points are added onto your ATAR to increase your selection rank for that particular degree. So if you're eligible for three HSC plus points and you had a 90 ATAR, you now have a 93 selection rank for the university. That is equivalent to a student who has a 93 ATAR by itself. 
Um, and so that opens up a wide range of degree options to you. So do be mindful of HSC Plus bonus points. The good thing about them is that they are automatic. You won't have to apply for them. They will just be added automatically for you to your ATAR to increase your selection rank. If you want to find out what subjects apply to bonus, uh, for bonus points and what band scores and for what degrees, they are all listed on the HSC Plus website and you can see that information today and look at that. It's also grandfathered in for two years, so if there is a change, you'll know about it two years in advance. So that's HSC Plus bonus points. We also have the Elite Athletes and Performers bonus points. These are, again, a maximum of five points that you can get for elite level participation in sport, music, leadership, academics like debating, but all at a national or a state or national level or higher. And it needs to be elite. So what have you done in this space? It might be AMEB grade eights. It might be school captain. It might be that you are Duke of Ed gold um, or pursuing a Duke of Ed gold. It might be that you're a state sport something. Um, there's a huge range of things that can apply here. But the key difference between HSE plus points and EAP points is that you need to submit an application in year 12 to tell us how awesome and amazing you actually are so that we can really award those bonus points to you. We don't have a crystal ball. We can't just know know that you're amazing and award these points, so do make sure that you submit an application um, by the deadline in the in your end of your year 12 year. Usually the deadline is after the HSC exams, um, so do make sure that you have a look at those if you think that's something that might apply for you. It does need to be something that you have completed or participated in in year 11 or year 12. If you just did your AMEB grade 8s, unfortunately that will not count because it will have been completed in year 10, so keep that in mind as well. Finally, EAS bonus points. Um, educational Access Scheme is run by UAC on behalf of most universities in New South Wales and the ACT and is for students who have suffered long-term educational or socioeconomic disadvantage. What does long-term mean? It means more than six months. Um, and it's important that this is documented as much as possible. So if you are experiencing any sort of disadvantage that is long-term, whether it's a family issue or a, an economic issue or a health issue or a death of a family member or something else that is equally horrible, um, please make sure that your school is aware of that disadvantage. Um, whether it's, it doesn't have to be a careers advisor or a principal, it just needs to be someone who you trust at the school who is in a position of authority and can make sure that they're aware of, of that disadvantage. You will need to submit an application for those bonus points as well via UAC, um, and you can get up to 10 here at UNSW, but between the three schemes, HSC+, Plus, Elite Athletes and Performers, and EAS, the maximum number of points you can get here at UNSW is 10. However, in that scenario where someone had a raw ATAR of 90 and they were eligible for 10 points across those three schemes, they would have a perfect selection rank of 99.95 here at UNSW. So that is a, a significant change to your eligibility for a number of degrees. If you have questions about bonus points, please feel free to talk to us afterward um, and we'll, we're always available to answer any questions that you might have as well in year 11 or year 12. So do take advantage of that. Finally, we do have guaranteed entry here at UNSW as well. Um, there is a guaranteed entry rank published in the guide as well as an actual cutoff. So the cutoff is what it took to get into that degree in semester one of this year. Guaranteed entry is what, if you have that ATAR, our selection rank, um, in first semester of next year, you will be guaranteed to receive an offer at U to UNSW in the guaranteed entry round. So there will be more information on that available to you as you get to year 12, but just be aware of what that, that's what you're looking at in the guide tonight. So I'm now going to hand over to David Abihana, who is one of our current students in the Bachelor of Medical Science. Um, he is going to give you a brief overview of scholarships and what you need to know and why as a year 10 student it matters to be thinking about scholarships now. David. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Jonathan, for the introduction. So uh, I am a fourth year medical science student here at UNSW, and I will try and give you a brief overview of all the scholarship programs that we provide. And to start off with, uh, we'll talk about why the university offers scholarships. Um, so the main reason is to provide the financial support to students, and this support ranges from $2,000 to $25,000 per year. So it makes a big difference to a student studying at university. Um, the scholarships are designed to recognize academic achievements and also to support diversity and equity, uh, assisting students who otherwise may not have been able to attend the university at all. There are a large range of scholarships available at UNSW and they fall under very diverse areas um, that come up on the next slide. And so these are the large range of scholarships available. 
And the message is you don't have to be the smartest kid in your class to, to get a scholarship. We have, we have more than just academic scholarships available at the university. The focus in the future is on equity scholarships. So again, assisting students who have financial or other disadvantages. And currently we have, as you can see the figures, over 400 scholarship holders, or programs, sorry, um, offering over $15 million per year to over 2,000 scholarship holders. And that's excluding postgraduate and research, research scholarships. So there are a lot of different ones available and we encourage everyone to have a look at it and apply, basically. So what is the scholarships office looking for in your application to the university? Um, so the first thing is your interest. So your interest in the programs that you're applying to, um, your interest in the university itself, and any future career opportunities that you're thinking of pursuing after university, academic achievements and other types of achievements that you may have, um, your leadership skills inside of school and outside of school, so times you've stepped up or how you've made a contribution at school, uh, your community involvement, so interests and passions and how you're spending your time outside of school, and finally, most importantly, the, your ability to sort of make a contribution to the university and how you're going to give back and um, make your mark here. So we're giving you this, this talk while you're in year 10 because you still have time to act on this. You still have time to get involved in things at school and to better your application so that when, when you get to year 12, um, you, you can sort of be more eligible for a, diff, a, a wider range of scholarships that we have available. So finally, the application process. So it's a very easy, quick, online process. It happens in your year 12 year, and it, applications open in June, July, and close in September. And um, it's one batch application for all the scholarships that you're, you're eligible for. So you jump online, you type in all your details and answer all the questions, and then a list of scholarships that you're eligible for pops up, and it's one batch application with generic questions for the majority of the scholarships there. Um, so we definitely encourage all of you to sort of look into it, get involved in things while you're at school, and start thinking about how you're making a contribution and, and the types of things that you're interested in and your passions. And uh, yeah, good luck with your application. Thank you. Hi guys, um, I'm Michelle, I'm from the co-op program, and I feel like we've thrown a whole bunch of information at you tonight, so um, I just want a little bit of crowd involvement. Just raise your hands, anyone who's involved in competitive sport at the moment? Anyone at all? Yeah? Anyone who does music or performing arts, dance? Yep, fantastic. How about um, involved in your community or church? Anyone at all? Excellent. Anyone working towards like a leadership role at school? Maybe captain, house captain, um, part of the SRC. Fantastic. Okay, so those people who have raised their hands, and I suspect some people who didn't raise their hands, are already on the right track to be um, part of the co-op program scholarship. Anyone who isn't, as David said, the reason we're talking to you tonight is you've still got plenty of time to get involved in these things and start doing them. So um, what is it? We talk about co-op program um, as a career development scholarship. It's an opportunity for um, major companies to work with some of the best and brightest students at the university. So it's evolved because these companies wanted to have students who were graduating who not only had the theoretical capabilities but also the practical skills and the management capabilities to really hit the ground running when they started um, in the workplace. So obviously your degree and your theater theoretical knowledge that you get here at university is really important Important, but so are those practical skills and sometimes there's a bit of a gap between the real world and what you learn in the classroom. So we're trying to bridge that gap. Um, our co-op scholars leave the university already with a really impressive resume um, and it gives those graduate recruitment companies opportunities to, to work with those students and recruit them often before they're even starting their final year of university. So last year, probably about 70% of our co-op scholars started with graduate offers, multiple graduate offers in their hand in their last year um, of university. So it really gave them a bit of an edge. So why would you consider co-op? Um, we call it connecting with your future as a university student. So that whopping $18,200, um, which I forgot to mention earlier, which is one of the great reasons people do join the program, um, it's really not just about the money though. It is about your career development. So for all of the reasons that you can see up there, it is an industry-linked scholarship, so our students are getting between nine and 18 months of industry placement in the industry that they are hoping to work in once they graduate. Um, and that's with 
one of the over 150 companies that are involved with the program right now. So Coca-Cola, um, the Reserve Bank of Australia, Jaguar Land Rover, Cochlear, ResMed, these aren't tiny little companies, these are big names who are doing great things around the world in, that, in those industries. Our students get leadership and professional development from day one all the way through their degree. So again, we're building on those um, skills that you've already started to develop in the activities that you've undertaken in high school. Um, and it also gives you an opportunity to network. You'll have mentors, both academic and, um, and industry mentors, um, and it really just creates this whole package for you to actually develop as a really great professional before you're even starting um, and going out into the world. So what can you do to maximise your chances of being a co-op scholar? These are some of the things our 2017 co-op scholars were involved in throughout high school. Okay, and it's definitely not a checklist. I don't need you to tick off every single one of these because you will fall over before you even get to university. But what we're looking at is things that, like volunteering, like public speaking. Um, some of them might have been doing surf life saving. One crazy kid already was doing TED Talks in grades 10 and 11. So it doesn't matter what you do, it's about demonstrating your time management, your passion, your interests, um, and your involvement with your community throughout high school whilst also performing well in your HSC. So I do need to let you know one of our criteria for the co-op program is a minimum ATAR of 96, um, but this is not the time to rule yourself out, okay? If you're thinking you might get an ATAR anywhere in the 90s, as Trudy said, you really don't know where you're going to end up. You just need to work and get your, um, make sure you keep doing these things. This is the really important message for you to take away tonight. Keep those activities up, don't just bog down in the classroom, and give yourself a chance to um, achieve outside the classroom as well as inside. So we do have a website, of course. I can only give you a couple of minutes before Jonathan will jump up on stage and hook me out. So jump on the website, have a look at, um, at all of this information here. It's very simple. Future Students is for future students. Um, if you jump on Experience, there's stories about our scholars and our alumni, what they've been involved in. Um, all of the different programs that we have in the business and engineering faculties, in the science faculty and some parts of the built environment. And the FAQs actually are frequently asked questions. Not surprising, but you'll find a lot of answers there. And just in case you do know anyone who is in, uh, from a rural area and interested in engineering, we also um, take care of the rural engineering program where students who are from a rural area interested in studying in one of the 20 or so um, engineering programs that are supported in that um, receive around $12,000 each year for four years of study. Now I'm gonna hand over to Jonathan again, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So that co-op scholarship at $18,200 $18, per year for the length of your degree is a great opportunity, and there are scholarships that range all the way from $500 one-off all the way up to $25,000 per year. So do make sure that you have a look at those, all of those scholarship opportunities that may be available to you. I'd now like to welcome Heidi Wright, who's here to share. She's a, a fourth-year mechanical engineering student to share a little bit about her year 10 subject selection experience and journey to UNSW. Thanks, Heidi. So hi everyone, as Jonathan mentioned, my name is Heidi. So this is my fourth year that I've spent at UNSW. Uh, I was like you guys once, I was in year 10 looking at the prospects of university and I wasn't sure exactly how I'd go along that path. Uh, in year 10 I was involved in a lot of extracurricular activities, everything from school SRC to surf club. And I remember going into year 11 and 12 and people were saying things like, oh, you need to focus on school, you need to focus on study, you've got year 11 and 12 coming. Uh, but I was someone that kind of wanted to do everything, so I decided to continue with a lot of my extracurricular activities through year 11 and 12, and I found it a great way to balance out my study uh, along with sport and other activities, so it wasn't all just about waking up every day to go to school, and I really enjoyed that. So down to the subjects that I picked in year 11 and 12, what I always try and encourage people to do are to pick subjects that you're passionate about and you're interested in learning, and also pick to your strengths. Uh, for me, I knew that I was fairly good at maths, uh, and so that was definitely an area that I was picking in. But I also really enjoyed sport and activities, and so studying PDHPE uh, was enjoyable for me, so that's why I picked those subjects. Uh, going through to year 12, I actually dropped out a of a couple of subjects, so I decided that I didn't want to do legal studies, and I didn't like my physics teacher, so I dropped out of physics. Um, to be honest, 
there's always going to be that as well. You might not like the class, you might not like the teacher. And for me, I found that learning environment wasn't conducive with me going well. So that's why I made the decision to drop out of that subject. But at the end of the day, I still got into the course that I wanted to, um, and that didn't change anything. I just focused on what I needed to do, and I continued studying. So at the end of year 12, when it came to putting my UAC preferences in, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I had all of these different options, um, and I just didn't know where to pick. So what I did was I just looked at what I had on offer. I ended up deciding that I was interested in both science and engineering, and the wonderful thing about UNSW was I could study both, and I decided I could always make up my mind later, and if I changed my mind, I could always switch programs as well. And having not done physics, I was still eligible to get into engineering. I just had to work a bit harder during first year, but I managed to catch up, and I was really interested in, uh, in continuing with engineering, and I was less interested in science, but having that option of doing the dual degree to start with gave me that flexibility to work out where I wanted to go with my degree. So some of the reasons why I picked UNSW are very personal to me. Uh, so I decided to come to UNSW because they have the largest judo team in Australia. Now that's not a reason that most people decide to pick a university, but for me that was one of the personal reasons that I decided to come here. And that said, the experience is going to be different for every single one of you. Uh, at the end of the day, you're going to have your parents telling you to go one way, your careers advisor and your friends trying to, trying to encourage you to do different things. But you're the person that has to come to university for three, four or five years. So you need to pick for yourself and consider what applies to you, whether you have to travel to get to university, whether you like the campus, whether you can handle walking up Bass's stairs every day. So it's always going to be a very personal experience. So you should remember that when it comes, uh, comes time to choose in year 12. Uh, so since I've been at UNSW, I've had a really fantastic experience here. Uh, in first year, I was able to volunteer and go over to Nepal to, uh, to teach English. Uh, I've had quite a few international trips, uh, and I've had a lot of fun just learning on campus every day. Uh, last semester as well, I was lucky enough to study abroad in Canada as part of my program. Uh, being at UNSW, we are one of the most global universities in Australia. We have over 200 exchange partners all around the world. Uh, and I was lucky enough to go to Canada as part of my program. I could go between six and 12 months during my program, and it was only pass-fail, which meant as long as I just passed my courses, I had the same marks when I got home, and in the same time, I managed to squeeze a road trip in around the country. So that's an experience that I really appreciate being able to get out of UNSW. So that's kind of my journey so far, and I hope you guys are able to make your own. Thank you, Heidi. So that brings to a close most of our evening. There's a couple of key things that I want you to take away, though. So this is a list of all of the different activities, or just some of the activities that we have between now and the end of the year. I'd like to most draw your attention to Open Day, which is on Saturday, the 2nd of September, that even as a year 10 student, it is time for you to be starting to think about attending Open Days, whether that's here at UNSW or other universities, to get a feel for, does this feel like the right place for me? Um, and what is it that I want to study, and where do I want to study it, and what are the resources available to me at any particular university? There's also a huge range of uh, information evenings that are faculty-specific or workshops in particular areas that you can enroll in, so do check out the What's On website um, for more information about those particular events. Finally, it is about making the right choice for you. I studied here at UNSW. I, I confess I do have an accent. I did not grow up here in Australia. I did my Master's of International Law and International Relations here at UNSW. I loved my degree. Um, they also pay me to tell you how amazing UNSW actually is. Um, but it's really, really important for us as an institution, as a university, that you come here because it's the right place for you. And if it's not, that's okay. There are lots of great universities to choose from here in the Sydney metro area and across Australia and the world. So make sure that you visit as many universities as you're considering as you can between now and, and the end of year 12, and make that decision about what feels right. If it doesn't feel right, that's okay. Um, I won't hate you personally forever, um, but we want you to come here because it's the right place for you. So without any other, and finally, that a uh, little bit of important information. I will hope that you all have grabbed the 2018 undergraduate guide from up at the faculties. They will be available until 8 p.m. this evening up in Tyree, so you can go chat with them if you have specific questions. But you can also download a copy of the, a personalized guide, so you can request information that's specific to who you are and what you're interested in. The year 10 guide goes into information about how to pick your subjects. So do have a look at that website, unsw.guide, and you can download uh, in, and create a personalized guide that you can then download and use as well. 
If you have questions ever, you're always welcome to contact us in the Future Students Office. Our contact details are on the back of the guide as well. Um, we are available, whether it's via phone, email, web inquiry form, or Facebook message, whatever it is that you want to try to get a question answered, um, don't hesitate to contact us. It is way better to go with the information you get directly from a university than what you get from your brother, sister's cousin, because um, I promise we know it a little bit more than they may in their own personal experience. So thank you again for coming. Please do chat with the faculties. Please grab some sandwiches on your way out as well. And thank you again for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you.